The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give to eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you have given, given me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given them. And they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Seated, please. I grew up in the Dutch Reformed Church, trained in that, raised in that tradition by, as you heard me say, I think before, by good Dutch Reformed Sunday school teachers. But we were a very mixed religious family. I mean, my half of the family, at least, was Roman Catholic. And we even had a few Episcopalians sneak in under the wire. Mostly the result of mixed marriages, I have to say, because if we didn't come from an Episcopalian country. Um, but, but there was, we were a mixed family. My Roman Catholic um, relatives used to impress me as a child because they had this thing, they would talk, I hear my aunties and my older cousins particularly talking about, we made a novena, we're making a novena, novena. That was a, a lovely kind of word, novena. It was foreign, it sort of had a kind of panache about it. I had no idea what it meant as a child, but learned pretty quickly that it was basically a, a, a nine-day period of focused prayer. And, uh, you know, that this is, you, you, would, that you would go for a novena in church, there would be a focus on, on some issue, some concern that the people had or that you had as an individual, and you would, you would make this nine days of prayer, uh, targeted prayer, you might say. It was kind of a, a nice idea. And I especially got to appreciate it when I was later on in life ordained a priest and every so often one of my cousins or, or relatives would send me a nice little on a Christmas card or something and say that I was being, there was a, a novena being made for me, which is kind of humbling to realize that people are actually praying for you and caring you know, about you. But this one is a nine day period of prayer. And what I eventually discovered to my amusement and to a certain extent excitement was that the original novena is that period in the church's liturgical life, in the church's worship life, when we, between the Feast of the Ascension and the day of Pentecost, nine days, count them out on your fingers if you must, but nine days when the people, the disciples of Jesus were gathered in prayer, focused in prayer. Jesus had said to the disciples, um, as he stood there on that hillside before he ascended into heaven, after he told them to stop worrying about times and seasons, that's not their business, but he said, but he said to them, stay in the city, stay in the city, 
until the Holy Spirit is sent upon you to give you power to do what you have to do, to be the witnesses you have to be. Uh, stay in the city. And so they're told, we're told that after he ascended into heaven, after they heard the, the admonition from the angels, uh, why are you looking up? Because Jesus will come again. Uh, get on. You know, it's another way of saying get on with your life here. They went back to the city, and we're told that they gathered every day in that upper room, probably the upper room where, they, where Jesus had celebrated the supper with them on the night before he was betrayed. They gathered there as faithful witnesses, and their name, all of the 11 of the disciples, as well as some women, and Mary specifically is mentioned, Mary, the mother of, of Jesus, and his brothers. They're all there gathered together in prayer. There's a couple points I want to uh, uh, see in that. Don't, don't just dismiss the simple fact that Mary was only mentioned. I think it's significant that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was mentioned in that group of waiting, um, eagerly waiting, prayerful people who gathered, knowing that something was going to happen, and in you know, prayer for that to take place. Mary became very early on in the, in the life of, of Christian believers, um, she became a kind of type of what Christian life is supposed to be. So for some obvious reasons. I mean, for a start, she responded. Think of the, just quickly run through the, the thoughts of Mary, because St. Luke, who writes the Acts of the Apostles and gives us this information that she was there praying with the group as they gathered in the upper room. This, Luke was the one who reveals most about the mother of our Lord and indicates that she was there from, you know, at, at the beginning when, when Gabriel announced to her what God's plan was. After kind of a, a confused, maybe questioning kind of response, she says, well, be it unto me according to what you've said. That's fine. She agrees to cooperate with God. And there's a sense in which that's one of the things we honor her for, that we see in her what should be within in every Christian. She's a kind of type of Christians. We respond to God. There's a moment where Jesus at a wedding feast in Cana is, is confronted by his mother who says they're running out of wine. You know, she's a you know, woman, he said, rather harshly, I think, woman, what's that to you and me? Oh, my hour has not come. And then she turns to those who were there, the servants, and she says to them, a, a good, and the word is it's significant, do whatever he says. <laughs> Think of that. Do whatever he says. But she didn't always understand Jesus. We're told that too, that there, she was gathered with his brothers outside when he was, and because they thought maybe he was making a fool of himself or stepping out beyond, I don't know what exactly their concern was, but they just, where they were concerned, his family gets sometime, and he had to admonish, who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters, those who hear the word of God. But Mary was there, and she was there at the foot of the cross. She was there when the disciple was told to take her in as his own mother. She was there to witness that sorrow and, and horror. And then she's there with now, we're told, she's there with those who gathered to pray. When Jesus now ascended into heaven, Jesus said, stay in the city and wait for the power to come from on high. And she was there with that group. In a way, it's, you, you can see why she becomes the type of all Christians, because she literally bore God within her, and we're all called to bear God within us. So Mary was there, and that's significant. And I don't think we should miss that, even because it's just said in, in such a way. Um, and maybe because it's, you know, May in, in, in Catholic tradition is the month of Mary, so maybe that's why I'm thinking about it too. But it's significant that she was there, she who is the type of what you and I are called to be as Christian people. People who bear God within us, who, you know, struggle to learn and understand what God is about, who do what he says, you know, who, who try to do what he says, and people who are there in the, in the sorrows and in the hopeful joy. We're there. But what do these people do, disciples and Mary and the family and brothers of Jesus and the other women that were gathered, what did they do in that period? I mean, we say they gathered in prayer. And I suspect that, you know, you probably like me, when you first hear that word, you think prayer is something, you know, you just say something or do something. But how would, what were they gathered to do in that period of time of waiting? 
that period in between when the spirit had not been given to them. They didn't know what was going to happen on the day of Pentecost. They didn't know about the rushing wind and the fire that you'll hear about next week. They didn't know any of that. Probably what they did, and I think what prayer is about, is, for a start, they probably thought about their recent experience with Jesus. What they had been through. What he'd said, what he'd done, what he showed them, what it made them feel, what it made them think, what it did for them. They probably also, and I even perhaps most important of all, look back on, on, on the whole of their tradition. It says that Jesus, you know, at, at several points after his resurrection, explained to them from the scriptures the things concerning himself. They probably looked into their scriptures. Remember, their scriptures were not what we, they would be what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew. Nowadays, it's, it, it, people like to say the Hebrew Bible. That's what would have been their scriptures. They wouldn't have had gospels. They wouldn't have had um, uh, epistles or anything like that. But they would have had the Hebrew Bible, and they would have seen, as Jesus himself tried to point in the direction, that he was fulfilling those, the law and the prophets in so many ways. And they would have thought about that, and they would have thought about his presence among them, what he said about, you know, about the, the, the sacraments, uh, the, this bread, this wine, this is my body, this is my blood. They would have thought about these things, this, the word, the sacraments. And they would have probably looked into their present condition and into the future and, and looked at hopes and dreams that they might have had, all of this would be uh, subsumed, you might say, in the idea of being at prayer. Because what else does it mean? I mean, think of what prayer, the classical model, we talk about prayer is, is about thanksgiving, it's about adoration, it's about praying for others, intercession, it's about recognizing our failures and, and in confession, asking for forgiveness. It's about all those things that is brought together. And this is what they would have been living through, I think, in, those, in that period of nine days, that novena of prayer, the nine days of prayer that the disciples would have had, waiting and anticipating. And they would have been in a spirit of, well, hopefulness, I think, because Jesus had said, stay in the city until power is given to you from on high. And they had no idea what that meant. I think that's significant, that this time and, and that whole time of, of, of prayerful waiting and wondering, in the time in between, between the ascension of Jesus, his leaving them physically on one sense, and their discovering the power of Jesus within them on the day of Pentecost, that time is significant for all of us, because I think every one of us has in life you know, moments when we go through, we're sort of in between. Things have been before, um, we knew things before, but where, are we, where, where, is, where is it going to take us? Where, where does it go from here? We all of us find ourselves in that kind of predicament from time to time, but most particularly, let's be blunt, in this congregation, that's exactly where you are. That's exactly where you are. You're in a time in between. You're in a time when, you know, you remember, you have remembrances of things that have been before of the way it was when you had a, when Father Mark was here and you had a, you know, a kind of stable, and, what, and all those years of, of, of life together as a, as, a, as a parish church in this community, serving and, and doing what you needed to do. And you don't know what it'll be. You don't know what's coming. You don't know how you're going to proceed and what will be the best way, what opportunities, what, uh, what, what will come your way, what will, you know, how is it going to look, what it's going to be like. What, what's going to be different, what's going to be the same. You don't know all that. And it can be, in one sense, disconcerting unless you're filled with a kind of hopefulness, the hopefulness that I think the disciples and, and Mary and the others were filled with when Jesus said, stay in the city until power from on high is, is come, comes upon you. They knew that whatever it was, they couldn't, didn't know what it was, but they knew that it was going to be good. And so in hopefulness, they were kind of prayerful. And that prayer, as I said, it's about looking, looking at what was. First of all, looking at, at who you are as a, as, a, as a people. What is the foundation? What do the scriptures say? What, are the, is the, what is the place of the sacramental presence of Jesus in our midst? What is that all? What has that meant in the past? How has that worked for us? This is part of our, part of our prayer. How has that gone? Who are we in, in light of the scriptures, the word and sacrament? Who are we?
Who are we? How has that worked? And what has it meant to each of us and corporately to the whole community? How has that worked? What has it meant to be part of this community? Because we always say parish church. The thing I don't like about the Episcopal Church is we use the word parish all the time and we never seem to use it right. We think that the parish means the congregation. Oh, the parish of such and such. And we think of membership. The parish is a territorial term. For some reason, God planted a church, that's you, here in the midst of a place, that's your parish. And everybody, you know, you're in a sense, I like, maybe I'm just a medievalist, but I think that, you know, what the intention of a parish designation was, you're in charge, or I'm in charge, you're responsible for everything over the people around you. When I was in Liverpool, uh, I, I served the time there in a parish in the inner city of Liverpool, and the Bishop of Liverpool, a very wise man, also a very good cricketer, but that was another story. <laughs> but a very wise man came to visit our parish and, uh, at, at St. Margaret's in the, in the heart of Coxteth in, in uh, Liverpool, in one of the hard neighborhoods in Liverpool. And he said that he met with the parish church council, which is the equivalent of vestry, and he said to them, you know, you have 8,000 people in your parish. We had 80 people on Easter Day for communion, but that's another story. We have, but he says, you have, you have 8,000 people in your parish. And if they're not going to the Roman Catholics or the Methodists or some other Christian community, it's your responsibility to be the good news of Jesus Christ for them. And I thought, when I came to Camden after that, I thought, that's, a, that's a, to me as, as good an idea a strategy for mission as ever I've heard. What, how it fleshes out into, you know, into, into reality that will depend on what opportunities come your way and what circumstances. But you have how many people in your parish that you're responsible to proclaim, to be the good news to? This is something to prayerfully think about, I think, in this time in between. Your extended novena, if you like, if you like to use that word, but this is, this is uh, I, I think, what we celebrate today is a point in the life of the church when those who were the faithful ones at the very beginning were told that something wonderful was going to happen, but they had no idea what. But they had hope because of who said it, Jesus. And so they gathered for this kind of prayer where they, I'm sure, as I said, all the elements of prayer, they, I'm sure they gave thanks to God for his blessings. Gave thanks to God for his goodness and just being here for all of us and with all of us. And they adored him, I'm sure, in, in, in the majesty when they probably thought about the, the whole experience that they would have had of the risen Jesus, the various experiences, and then his leaving them at the ascension. There's a, there's a kind of grandeur about that, that uh, that they would have to have adored. They would have thought about the people around them. And it would have been a kind of sense of intercession, the need to care about others, because that was built into who Jesus was and who he taught them they should be. And then there would have been that sense of, of, of uh, just acknowledging that sometimes things go wrong, things have to change, things have to be different. What we call in classical prayer language, you know, confession and moving, and, and then forgiveness and moving onward. This is a moment. So I just say this, you know, that as we celebrate this particular Sunday, it just strikes me that this is a moment that in a sense describes it. Don't let it pass by. Recognize that this is a time to prayerfully live and look, hopefully, to the future. Because the Lord who was there at the beginning, the Lord whose face we know in Jesus Christ, the Lord who shows us uh, what God is like, has prayed that you and I will be, and all of us together as church, will be united with him in a, in a kind of oneness that's beyond our wildest imaginations, and yet it's joyful good news. Let's grasp it. Let's use the time prayerfully and wait for the empowerment that comes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.